Welcome to The Plant Report, a radio show that educates about the green world one plant at a time. The Plant Report is a new educational resource about plants, herbal medicine, ethnobotany, and the human-plant relationship. Listen to our podcast, read our blog, watch our videos, and learn from experts and the plants. The Plant Report is a project of Sustainable World Radio and is hosted by Jill Cloutier. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report because every plant has a story. My guest today is Linda Bazell Saltzman. Linda is a psychotherapist and founder of the International Association for Ecotherapy. Linda is also the co-editor of the book Ecotherapy, Healing with Nature in Mind. I met Linda in her backyard food forest where she and her husband Larry grow nearly 100 fruit and nut trees and many gorgeous roses. Linda, if you could just say a few words about the work that you do. Um, I've been a psychotherapist for 40 years and an ecotherapist since 2000. So I like to work with people, helping them reconnect to the rest of nature. So, Linda, if you could tell us a bit about roses, and I think that you're growing quite a few roses. I think you're involved with the local Rose Society, and, and maybe share with our listeners, when we're talking about roses, what, what's the Latin name of this group of plants that we're talking about? Well, we're talking about the Rosaceae family, and roses are certainly part of it, and there's also a lot of fruit trees, because we forget that roses are actually an edible plant, that we can eat the hips which are really the fruits that have the little seeds in them. And we can also eat the petals, which we use on our salads every day. Oh, interesting. This is great. I had no idea. And so um, what is it about roses, Linda, that really drew you into them? I, I have known you for many years. When I first met you, I don't recall you being as interested in roses as you have gotten to be in the past few years. What is it about roses that you love and what makes you continue to grow them? Wow, I just love roses, and I tried to grow some of the modern hybrid tea roses that are mostly now considered kind of fussy divas, and they take a little more water, and they are not always fragrant, and I totally failed with them. And I got so frustrated until I joined the local rose society, and I started learning about heritage roses, the older roses and some of the survivor roses that people have discovered around old houses and in cemeteries that absolutely like this area and they've survived all kinds of bad weather, drought, no water, all of that. And I thought, those are the roses I want. (laughs) The more resilient roses. Exactly. The tougher roses that I know are going to do well here. And that's exactly how it's worked out. As I, The more I've learned about the older and the found roses, the more I'm really in awe of what a strong plant this is. This is not some kind of diva that shouldn't be in modern gardens. These roses have been around for 35 million years, and we have the fossil record to prove it. And there's a reason that people just love roses, and it's not just because they look pretty. You know, they have they provide food, they have this wonderful smell that's really a kind of aromatherapy or even an ecotherapy. They've been used medicinally for centuries. Plus, I mean, you can't discount the beauty of the rose and the symbolism. It's really an image of the archetypal feminine. So women always love roses. (laughs) I know. I, I love that smell. I'm into essential oils, or I work a lot with essential oils. And when you find a real authentic rose essential oil, it's heaven. Isn't it amazing? And, and people just have an instinct for it. If you hand someone a rose, the first thing they'll do is stick their nose in it. And it's part of why people have gotten so fed up with many of the modern roses. It's not just the garish colors and the fact that some of them are what I call drug addicts. But it's basically the disappointment when you stick your nose in a rose and there's nothing there. It's like, no, that's not what they're supposed to be like. That is so true. So... You talk talking about heritage roses, which are the old roses. Are these like heirloom vegetables in a way that were passed down through families? Or um, would you say it's a similar thing? Exactly. It's really, really similar to that. And there have been a number of people who call themselves rose wrestlers 
who've gone out and tried to rescue these old things, just the way that we're doing with um, heritage vegetables and now even heritage animal uh, breeds. So that we're beginning to reclaim that, that, that heritage, literally, and finding those and then getting them back in commerce. That's been the trickiest part, is letting people know that they exist and that they're really good in a certain area. Because not all roses like every single area. So you really want to contact your local rose society and see what grows well in your area. So when I think about growing roses, I think... Uh, like a lot of people, I believe that they need a lot of inputs and that they're very fussy, like you were saying, and very picky. Tell us about um, your experience growing heritage roses. What do they need to thrive? Well, the interesting thing is that many of them could survive and have survived for a long time, even without us. So I like those kind of roses. You can go on vacation. Exactly. <laughs> those are good for the lazier gardener like me. But again, it, you, what you're looking for is the right rose in the right place. So you want to figure out what classes of roses do really well in your area. Uh, we live in a Mediterranean climate area, and the heritage tea roses do really well for us. And some of the tea noisettes and the polyanthus, and there's a bunch of other things that do well here. And that makes it easy because then you're not fighting the climate. I can't grow Ragosa roses, which I absolutely love. But, you know, when Larry and I were back east, we saw them growing wild in Maine in sandy soil near the coast. And I thought, well, no wonder they hate it here. I know. It's so so right plant, right place. Exactly. Mm. That's the key. That's great. Just like all plants, it's good for us, a good reminder for all plants. So um, these plants are pretty resilient. Can you grow them from, how do you grow them? Do you have to go to a store and buy the plant? Can you grow them from cuttings if you see a rose you really like? The good news is that many roses can be grown from cuttings. Now, it's kind of illegal to take cuttings of modern roses that are still under patent, but luckily those aren't the roses I want anyway. So if you find an older rose, yes, as long as you ask permission from whoever owns the property. It's not on your neighbor's lawn. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> At night with um, <laughs> dark clothes on. No. Exactly. <laughs> no, you should hear some of the stories from the rose wrestlers where they've you know, crawled under the barbed wire and gotten into a pasture. There's even a great rose that's called Barbara's Pasture Rose in honor of one of those things. <laughs> it's like, I can feel it beckoning to me. I must rescue it. Exactly. <laughs> and you can take cuttings, and then there's all kinds of great videos that are on the internet where you can learn how to actually grow a rose from a cutting. And it's wonderful because you realize that you can now have as many of that rose as you like. That's so cool. So that's a good thing to know. You can grow them from, from cuttings. Just so listeners know, in case they're not familiar with heritage roses, what is the difference between the style of the old roses, heritage roses, versus the modern rose? Well, you know, there's so many heritage roses, and they're so different from each other that there's certainly no way that you can just make a generality. Mm -hmm. But typically, many of the more recent hybrid teas um have been kind of upright and with one one flower per cane and they're a little bit gawky looking and they're not always a pretty garden plant. Now some of this is getting a lot better and some of the modern hybridizers are now really hybridizing for disease resistance whereas it used to be that they weren't for a while and they just figured well you can just spray so it doesn't matter if this rose is disease resistant or not. But the heritage roses, that's one of the nice things about them is they are so different. Some of the species roses and the things that have hybridized from them from the 19th century, even earlier. I mean, they're kind of amazing and there's a much wider variety than you might think. If you could share with our listeners just to some of the fascinating history, because roses have a long history, I've learned in the past week, um, doing a little bit of research. Maybe share a few interesting tidbits with our listeners about roses. Well, most people are kind of familiar with the use of roses by the ancient Romans, and that was kind of fun, you know, where they'd have rose petals falling on the banquets. I mean, they were, they were definitely used in many, many cultures, whether it was ancient China, and many of our excellent roses come direct from China. And of course, there was a whole period when we couldn't get into China to find all the interesting roses. So also ancient Persia, 
you know, the War of the Roses in England when the rose was a badge for the Yorks and the Lancasters, and then they came together. I mean, the rose symbolism has been used so much. Um, certainly, the rose is associated with various goddesses and with the Virgin Mary. I mean, there's almost no culture that I can think of that had the rose that didn't think it was something special and make it a really important part of their culture. Now, as Sufism too, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. It's. I think it's also seen just flowers in general as uh, enlightenment. Yes, definitely. And the rose, of course, is love. I read somewhere that what the lotus is to the east, the rose is to the west. So it's a very sacred flower. What are some successful growing methods or weight techniques that you use to make your roses healthy without the use of pesticides and herbicides and chemical fertilizers? Well, you, we haven't used any of those things on our roses, and it's really pretty simple. I mean, we like to use manure, which is a pretty natural product. And if you know anyone who has horses or chickens or anything, or you can use worm castings, any kind of natural food, roses really are not fussy. That's a mistake that we've thought of, is that they were somehow difficult. They really just need air, sunlight, and some food and water. And the thing to do with roses in terms of water is, if you're in an area like we are where water is not so plentiful, is to water them less frequently and let them get their roots down really deeply. And then you'd be amazed how little water that roses can go without. And they may go dormant during the hottest, driest months of the year, but they won't die. Very seldom will they actually die. So you can keep roses going on not a whole lot of water. And so if you're preparing the soil for roses, you're working and do you work in the worm castings or the manure in the soil? Do you apply compost tea on them? All of that is good. You can do that. Definitely dig your hole and get as much good nutrition in there as you can. But don't make a round hole. That's a little secret that I just learned. Try and make a square hole or at least rough up the sides of the hole. So, and also when you take your rose out of the pot, if you've bought it in a pot, loosen up just a little bit so that the, the roots are being encouraged to get out into the surrounding soil and they don't just kind of go round and around in the hole. So if you do a round hole, they kind of just get stuck in there? Well, they can. They can, you know, because you put so much good stuff in that soil that they kind of really like it. They just hang out where the... the um nutrients are. Exactly. Yeah. Which is why, you know, some people say don't put a whole lot of wonderful stuff in that soil. You can put good things on the top and let them kind of soak in and that works well with or any kind of organics. That's a good thing to do. And is compost tea a good idea on roses? Because I've seen many rose leaves have kind of a mildew or some type of um, fungus on them. Any kind of compost tea is, they really, really enjoy it. So yeah, I think it, it just gives them good nutrition and raises their immune system. And you, would, you wouldn't spray the flowers though, would you? No, I don't think you'll need to, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Your flower would get gigantic. No. <laughs> okay. And then um, what about pests for roses? Are there certain creatures that really love to eat the roses or live on them that are detrimental to growing them? Yeah, there's always little things that you keep your eye out for. We don't spray at all. And there's things like rose slugs and different things. But what's, what's happening now in the rose world and is we're bringing back some of the disease resistance that used to be in some of the older roses. So the good news about a lot of the older roses is that many of them just don't get disease. Because they've survived for so long. Exactly. I mean, if they were really sickly, think how roses got passed along from one person to another. It's like you didn't pass on the rotten roses. <laughs> You know, you took cuttings of your favorite roses, and in fact, many of them came across this country with the settlers that they would bring a favorite rose, a cutting of a rose, either from Europe or from um, the East Coast, if they were coming to the West Coast, and those were the good roses. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, the survivors. Yeah, and, the, and people's favorites, you know, the ones that really touched your heart and really kept you in touch with the place that you came from. That doesn't mean there weren't roses here already, by the way, and there's some really interesting local species roses 
I mean, here we have Rosa Californica, but I'm sure people around the world also have local roses there. And those are really interesting to experiment with. Like I know there's a, a, a hybridizer in India who's now experimenting with some of the roses that are from that part of the world and crossing them with some of the European roses to get sort of that look, but at the same time have that vigor. And whenever you put a species rose and its genetics into the mix, you get a really strong rose. That's exciting. And what about um, wild roses? Is that Would that be your local rose? The wild rose exactly. The species roses are really good to investigate. And of course, they're different for different parts of the world. So if you're in Maine, you know, look for the Rugosa roses. If you're in California, look for Rosa Californica. You said roses are edible. And what in what ways are they edible? Oh, there's so many delicious things you could do with your roses. Most people know about rosehip tea, and you can also make jam out of rose hips. And there's, of course, the famous story of how people in World War II in, in England were able to get their vitamin C even when that was there was a blockade, and they could get it from their roses. But people often forget about the rose petals as being edible. And if you want something delicious to make... Take some pumpernickel bread and put some boursin cheese on it, some kind of herb cheese, and put rose petals on the top and maybe a little parsley, and you'll have a very decorative, fancy tea sandwich. Ooh, that's, I bet it's gorgeous, too. It's lovely. We, You know, we have uh, refreshments every time at our rose society, so we often have rose confections. Here's another one that's a good one that I somebody shared with me. You know those thumbprint cookies that you make that are really kind of like shortbread, they're delicious, and you make a little thumbprint and then you put something in the middle? Well, one of our members discovered that if she took raspberry jam or some kind of fig jam and ground um, fragrant rose petals up into the jam, (laughs) and then, you know, you cook the thumbprint cookie, and then she would just fill it with this rose raspberry jam and we tried those we those went disappeared in a minute oh my god were the petals chopped up or more or blended up totally could you feel the petal or see the petal in the no it was she just ground it up in in what we call here a matate it's like a grinding thing so this was a recipe from a woman named emma Cantu, who's a oh, great cook I, she's the hot pepper woman oh yeah. she makes a lot of good things we all pay a lot of attention to what she makes yes whenever she would show up to a party it's like i'm running over there <laughs> that is great yeah so rose hips so rose hips are actually the fruit of the rose exactly yeah. and the petals can make things like rose soda and rose syrup and of course you can make rose water But if you make something like rose syrup, you could put it in, um, or even soda, you can put it in lemonade. You could even put a little bit of it in champagne and have rose champagne. There's a lot of cool things you could do. That's great. I've also seen candied rose petals where you paint it with an egg white, I believe. Yep, those are delicious. I haven't tried one, but I've seen them. They're gorgeous. Yeah, I've been encouraging people, especially in, um, you know, edible landscapes and in permaculture landscapes, to not forget to put roses in there. We really need them because you want your garden to really be beautiful and productive. Now we know you can eat your roses as well. And what about medicinally? Do you, are you aware of any medicinal uses for roses? Roses have been used medicinally for, gosh, well over a thousand years. And one, one recipe I read about was they, they would grind it up and make a baby powder out of it to use for babies. And I realized, you know, I've been reading these articles about how talcum powder is so bad and this, and I thought, well, gee, we should be doing rose petal powder. Mm, I love that. And I know it's about the essential oil for rose. It's really wonderful for soothing, calming down, feeling almost euphoric in a nice, peaceful way. Yeah, I think that's really true. I think aromatherapy is important. And if you walk outside, if you're growing roses, you get instant aromatherapy. (laughs) We do. We do. Plus, it's very romantic. You know, when my husband goes out into the garden in the morning, he sees if any roses are out and he picks them and brings them to me. He brings you flowers. Yes. (laughs) So that's another good reason to grow roses in your garden. (laughs) That's great. So you mentioned permaculture and um, 
tell us a bit about, because you have a huge food forest in your yard. And if you want to hear about Linda's food forest, it's on a previous episode of the Sustainable World Radio podcast. I interviewed Larry, your husband, about the food forest. And we have videos of your food forest on our YouTube channel. And it's an amazing place. It's a beautiful backyard food forest, big garden. But um, you practice permaculture. How have roses been integrated into your permaculture design? Well, we just kind of pop them in everywhere. You know, the the great thing about permaculture food forests is that they're not, you know, in rows like rigid soldiers. We have all our fruit trees in, but there's, you know, companion planting and we want to create a guild. So roses are perfectly decent shrubs to pop in here and there, just the way you would put in any other edible shrub or edible uh, plant. And we just view them as part of the whole. They're part of the food system. And of course, the bees love them. Yes, yeah, so you're attracting pollinators to your garden. We are. And we try and get, uh, you know, we have some roses that are really full petal that the bees can't get into. But we also like to have some that are a little more open so that the bees can get right into the middle of them and get all the good stuff. As far as companion planting, are there some plants that like to grow with roses or that roses like to be around? Do you know? There are a lot of good companion plants. And again, this is going to depend on where you live. So I can't really say everybody should grow this next to their roses. But one thing we've discovered is that it's really helpful to keep the ground covered in what permaculture people call living mulch. So we have a lot of succulents around. We have lavender. We just have different things that do, you know, they perform different functions in the garden. And basically, we haven't found too many plants that the roses don't like. Obviously, we keep a little bit of open area around them. Not very much, though. We've got a lot lot of things growing on top of each other. I've heard, I don't know if you've heard this, but onions planted near roses are good to keep, I don't know if they keep away aphids or what the... I've heard, heard that? that too. Yes, mm-hmm. I think that's really true. Onions and garlic, anything like that is always helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are there any other uses of roses that you'd want to share with listeners or did we cover them? Some people make rosary beads. And you think about the word... You can actually grind up, as this is my understanding of it, you can grind up rose petals and form them into little beads and stick a needle through them and dry them, and then you can actually make beads out of roses. But there's so many uses for roses. I mean, honestly, you could probably just go on the internet and find a million (laughs) of them. Exactly, hundreds and hundreds. You can make potpourri, which is another fun thing you can do with them. And a really easy way to do this that I read about, it's called a kitchen colander potpourri. And you basically get a colander and put it on your counter. And, uh, you know, that has holes in the bottom. And when you come in from the garden, every time you're out, you have some petals or you have some lavender. And you just throw it in this colander and leave it there and it will dry itself. And you'll have kind of instant potpourri. That's great because the air, the holes will help. That's good so it won't get moldy. Exactly. And it's easy. That's what I like. Do you have a favorite rose or two that you would want to tell people about? Oh, I've got so many. Now you ask me a hard question here. (laughs) Well, for here, and of course, this may be totally different somewhere else. There's a rose called Rev d'Or, which is French for golden dream. And it's a beautiful climbing rose that's a tinoisette. It's an old rose. And that one might be worth trying if you're in a warmish climate. And there's another very old rose called Lamarck, which is also another climber. I'm a big fan of trying to grow roses up other things, trees, fruit trees, larger trees. It's kind of a very old-fashioned way of gardening, but I like the idea in permaculture of vertical gardening. So I like roses that will actually climb up and give you that. I mean, there's nothing like an amazing rose show in the spring where an entire tree lights up with yellow lady banks. Wow. (laughs) Love it. As an eco-psychologist, what effect would you say roses have on our psyche, our, our mind, our emotions? I think it's connected to what you said about aromatherapy, that there's something about the smell of a rose that simply starts to calm us down And it puts you in, um, I don't even know how to describe it, just a very relaxed, even a romantic state. It's just really good for us. (laughs) 
stop and smell the roses, right? <laughs> Have you ever taken clients out to be around the flowers or plants while you're working with them? I do that. And I have my little ecotherapy office in quotation marks where I do, I do work with clients. And of course, the roses are out there as, long, as well as the fruit trees and all the other plants. So it's you could watch people be almost pulled over to those roses. And again, the first thing we do, we stick our nose in them. And it's so soothing. It's so relaxing. It really, I think what scent can do in fragrance, it can take us out of, or for me at least, it can take me out of my mind. Those repetitive thought patterns that might cause distress and you just smell that smell. It's like oh, settling in. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. So Linda, thank you so much for your time today. And is there anything else you want to share with people about roses? Well, one thing I wanted to recommend is there's this fantastic website and it's called helpmefind.com slash roses. And all the rosarians in the world have posted the different roses there. And you can look up any rose or you can look up by a color or a characteristic. And there's also on the top, there's this wonderful little tab called buy from where they will list all the different places that sell these roses because many of them are not the roses you see in your local, you know, garden center. Some of these are a little more obscure, but this will tell you where to get some of these older roses. And also there are heritage roses groups around the country. So you can look those up on the internet and there's a Heritage Rose Foundation. So these are all good sources of information for people because some of the best roses that I love the most were not available commercially here. And some of the commercial roses, unfortunately, if it's a national chain, they may have roses in that chain. They bought them all in bulk. And basically, the, first of all, they're not very healthy. But second of all, they may absolutely be wrong for your area. And a lot of the plants, which I've been learning, and I'm sure you've heard this too, a lot of the plants we buy at large chains, not all of them, but they have the pesticides that are harmful for bees. Exactly. Whereas when you get them from a smaller nursery where you can really talk to people on the phone and they can talk to you about roses, and often they really love to talk to you about roses because <laughs> they're in it for love, a lot of them. So that's really a help because you could they can really help you pick a rose, choose a rose, and when you get it, you know that it's been grown with love and pampered by someone who really cares. <laughs> oh, that's great. So to become a Rosarian, what do you have to do? <laughs> I want to be when I love that name. <laughs> well, the American Rose Society has classes that will teach you how to be a consulting Rosarian. So you can become an expert and you can help all your neighbors with their roses. I better start growing some. Some first, but that's a great name. Are yeah, you a Rosarian. You are. <laughs> I, I'm a Ro I'm a Rosarian, but I'm not officially a consulting Rosarian, and that's partly because there really isn't a specialty yet for the heritage rose lovers. But we're working on it. Oh well, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Plant Report. The Plant Report is produced by Jill Cloutier and is a project of Sustainable World Radio. For more podcasts about plants, permaculture, and ecology, visit our website, sustainableworldradio.com, and you can also find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. The Plant Report is created for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any health condition. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to thank the plants for everything they do.